Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Chicory's Travels. One of the questions we get asked quite often is how much do campgrounds cost? And this answer depends on several factors. There's no straightforward answer to this question. So in this video, we're going to discuss the main considerations and provide several examples of campground fees. Yeah, and first, before we get started, we wanna make sure that we all have the same understanding of the terminology. So I'm just gonna run through a few terms that you'll see as you're looking for campgrounds, um, and they usually have a big impact on the prices anyway. So the first one is hookups. And so let's look at an example. Um, many privately owned campgrounds are what's known as full hookups. That's why people like them. And by full hookups, we mean you have water, power, and sewer right at your campsite. Now the next one is partial hookup. And this is a little more common in your public owned campgrounds like state and national parks. And by partial hookups, what we mean is it's not full. So usually the very first thing to go is sewer. Quite often you will see water and power, but we have stayed at plenty of public campgrounds that also only have power. And sometimes that power is also only 30 amp, not 50 amp. And then uh, finally, there's also no hookups. Dry camping, primitive camping are other words for that. I didn't say boondocking because boondocking usually means that you're outside of a campground. I'm talking about primitive or dry camping campsites in an established campgrounds. They do exist in national forests and other places like that. And even state parks, we recently found one that um, had dry camping as well. So those are the two main differences, uh, or actually three, I guess you should say, full hookup, partial hookup, or no hookup. But one other thing to know also about um, the full hookup is sometimes campgrounds, especially privately owned, will have other amenities as well. So things like um, equipment rentals, like they might have boats to rent or bikes to rent. They might have a camp store, um, swimming pools, um, sometimes even going all the way to like a full-fledged type of water park, activities for the kids, Wi-Fi, cable. These are all different things that you may or may not see at a campground or RV resort, and they're typically going to have an impact on the price of that. Yeah, and we just recently stayed at one in uh, Winchester, Virginia, where they charged for Wi-Fi access, and they also charged for cable if you wanted a cable hookup. So those can be on top of whatever the nightly rate is, if that's what you want. And then the other uh, definitions that we need to go over are the different types of campgrounds in name. So campgrounds, RV parks, RV resorts. Um, there's no rule to this. People can call it whatever they want. So you can see uh, uh, an ad for a resort and it looks like it shouldn't even be a campground. It's just uh, called a resort because it draws people in with that sense of what a resort really is. So really you just need to know what you want to search for it and we're going to do another video on, on how to find the best campgrounds where uh, we talk about Julie's process and how she reads reviews to figure that out. Um, then you can also have like KOA, they have different levels of their campgrounds. They have a uh, holiday resort and I forget what the first one is, but um, so you have to look at those as well. They might not have resort in the name, but some KOA holidays are pretty nice. Yeah, and Journey is the other one that he forgot about because those are the ones right off of the highway. So they're like, if they have a pool, it's just like a little rectangular thing, not too fancy, because these are the types of places people often stop for just one night, where the holiday, you hear what that implies, it implies a little bit more of a pool. Sometimes they have mini golf and, and things like that. So yeah, um, it, that's one of the nice things about the franchises is you kind of have an idea of what you're getting into, but I still say kind of because I always read reviews. They are franchises. That means they have private owners. So, yeah. yeah. 
So now what we're going to do is, now that you understand the definitions, we're on the same sheet of uh, paper there, let's talk about how much these actually cost. And so what we're going to do is give you some real world examples from our travels. And we will go from the least expensive to the most expensive um, throughout a range of two different, we're going to put them in two different buckets. Public, which is like state, national parks, Corps of Engineers, things like that and private. So let's start with the public. What was our least expensive public campground? So we stayed at Olenno State Park in Florida, and it was a partial hookup campground. Um, I believe we had water and electric, mm -hmm. and uh, it was $18 a night. Yeah, and they were um, nice size sites. I do love that about Florida State Parks, but I've Finding a lot of state parks, not only Florida, but especially Florida, seems to have very large sites. They might not be very deep in terms of like how long your RV is, but very wide, usually your own. This one even had a little fence around it. You'll see in the video there that kind of gave you a lot of uh, space. Yeah, Florida state parks are really nice. So another Florida state park that we stayed at, because I don't want you to think that all Florida state parks are the same price. And you'll find this in most states, they have a, a different range and it's usually depending on the location. So Oleno State Park was very nice, but it was kind of north central in the state. So it wasn't really by a major tourist area. It wasn't right on the beach. Now, Jonathan Dickinson State Park is yeah. one of our absolute favorites. It is in southeastern uh, part of the state. It is not on the beach, but it does have a river that runs through it. And it's only maybe a 10 minute drive to the beach, you think? Yeah, and it's close to Jupiter, Florida. Yeah, and, and they have full hookup sites. Well, they actually have two different campgrounds. So it's, they're both in Jonathan Dickinson, but you go to the right for the older one that is very small. I don't think even our 30 foot fifth wheel would fit in there very well, would it? That mm, small one? Be tight, yeah. yeah. And then over on the left is the newer one and that one is full hookups. The other is partial. So I'm not sure the price on the partial. If you have a small van type uh, or a tent set up, you might want to look into that if you want to save a few bucks. But even over on the full hookup sites, and these were huge sites, very big. deep, and they um, also were very large. Like you had a very big yard, I'll call it. $26 a night. Yeah, it was really good. And then we we stayed at a Corps of Engineer Park, um, which are fabulous compared when you compare them to state other federal or state campgrounds. These are really uh, up there on the list. And we stayed at Gunter Hill Corps of Engineer Park outside of Montgomery, Alabama. And it was $18.00 a night in a partial hookup old side and we stayed in the new hookup uh, full hookup side and it was $26 a night but we had a um, disabled veteran national parks pass so we were able to get it for 50% of that $26. And you can also do that with the senior citizen national parks pass. So another one, um, just to kind of go up in price here a little bit, we actually made reservations to stay at a no hookup. So this is a dry camping campground. It did have a dump station. I think it had one dump station for like 300 sites though. It was a pretty busy dump station. And it did have some water fill stations. But besides that, you had absolutely no hookups at your site, but it was right on the beach. It's Assateague National Seashore or Assateague State Park run by Maryland. And both of them run $30 a night for no hookups. Neither one of them have hookups. They do have bathhouses, but the sites are right. Like you can't, there's like a, um, a hill or they call it sand dune, a sand dune. I was going to say a hill of sand, mm -hmm. <laughs> a sand dune. And right, you just go right over that, and that's where the ocean is. So pretty amazing, but uh, more expensive for uh, less amenities. And we ended up not staying there because uh, one of the tropical storms were coming through. And so uh, we had to change our reservation from there. And we ended up staying at Cape Henlopen State Park, 
Delaware. In Delaware. And it was $40 a night for a site and their or pull-through partial hookups. Yeah, so that was for the pull-through. We actually had a back end, so it was only 33 a night for us. And all of them were partial hookup, though. I think it was 30 amp. Was it 50 amp power or 30 amp? 30 amp power. 30 amp power and um, water, but no sewer. But they had three dump stations for only like maybe 100 sites. Yeah. So let me tell you, that was my favorite, one of my favorite campgrounds of um, 2020, I think, was Cape Henlopen. It's like a, well, it's a cape. So it's similar to a peninsula in that you have water on three sides. But this one, it was the ocean on two sides and then the Delaware Bay on the other side. And the campground, it was a 15 minute walk to the water. So the campground was kind of internal to the state park. And then you had uh, beach access and bay access all the way around. And, Fabulous. And there was a lot of stuff to do there too. So we yeah. um, could ride bikes. They had an old military a site there that they offered tours through the bunkers, bird watching, fishing, beaches, beaches, yeah, just, lots of stuff there. Yeah, and let me just say on all these campgrounds that we're giving you examples of, we've just picked like five from each category. So we're getting ready to move into private. But I do want to let you know that we have reviews of these. We have video reviews here on our YouTube channel. But if you go to our website, chickeriestravels.com, there's a tab for campground reviews. And we go very into detail on all of the different campgrounds that we've stayed at. Yep. So jumping into some private campgrounds, just to give you the range here. Um, the first one, um, in order of price, the first one was uh, Chiriaco Summit Campground. And this is behind the Patton World War II Museum outside of Joshua Tree National Park on I-10, I believe it is, on the south side of Joshua Tree. Um, and it has no hookups, no dump station. It's just parking. It used to be some type of RV park, I think, but now it's just uh, empty. Uh, it's empty the museum kind of runs it i mm -hmm. guess fairly and they, level sites so. yeah they have a camp post there and uh it doesn't cost you anything you can stay for seven days we stayed there it was great it was real close to joshua tree so we were able to go there and we could go into the museum and check out the museum and they had a little gas station there as well so it was perfect for a few nights. Yeah, and we ended up finding by using the Campendium app that there was a dump station that was free, not too far away. So yeah, totally worked out. So um, another one um, that, so that was free. Now the next one kind of jumps up quite a bit because privately owned campgrounds are not um, super cheap. But what you, like we said, with most of them, except for this one example that we gave, the only dry camping one we've been at is most of them, are full hookups. So we stayed at one that was very no frills, but it was nice. It was on a river and it had full hookups and it was called Wagon Circle Campground in Heber Springs, Arkansas. And that was $30 a night, but it had great Wi-Fi too. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're always looking for because we're still working. And it had good trout fishing as well, right on the river. There was some people fishing down there when we walked and they were pulling out some nice sized trout. So um, yeah, it was great. And the host was friendly. Um, it was, it was great. Then we uh, move up a little bit more to the Tucson Lazy Days KOA. And this is more of a resort style. Um, two pools, two hot tubs, bar, restaurant, uh, propane right there. It's connected through a fence with uh, the Lazy Days RV dealership there in Tucson. And uh, it, we paid $42.95 per night to stay there in what season was that? Um, that was for the winter season. So that'd be December. It went up just a little bit in January. And then it goes down again in the, in the spring and summer. Uh, one thing, though, to say about uh, privately owned campgrounds and KOAs in particular, we've seen this quite a bit is that there is a price range within the campground itself. So we stayed in the cheap seats, right? We mm -hmm. stayed at the very back of the campground. They were back-end sites. 
although they were still very big. There were toy haulers there, you know, so they're still very big, but they're just back in and there are no frills. There are other sites in that same campground that they call Pull Through Deluxe. Some of them even have their own personal fenced in dog fence. And these can run up to $90 a night. So sometimes just looking within a campground can help you find a better deal. Well, we still had our own fruit tree. Mm -hmm. uh, we were patio yeah, with furniture we a on patio. it. We were, you know, less than 200 yards to the pool. Yeah, so, yeah, it was still amazing. And, and yeah. for us, it wasn't worth it to pay the extra money. We didn't have a dog with us, so we didn't need right. the dog fence. Um, there were other deluxe sites that maybe gave you a pavers on the patio instead of ours was like the white concrete, yeah. just, you know, rectangle. But for us, it wasn't really worth it to pay that extra money. We just wanted access to the hot tubs, especially. Yeah. And then we stayed at the Redwoods KOA up in Crescent City, mm -hmm. California, right up close to the uh, border with Oregon in essentially in the Redwoods National well, right outside of the Redwoods National Forest, but the campground had redwoods in it, mm -hmm. uh, massive redwoods uh, in the campground and a uh, small campground. Um, and it was $55 a night, uh, but it was amazing. Right. And that one also was, I think, at the end of May. So again, when Sean asked like the time of year for Tucson, it's pretty much the same for any place that's very popular at certain times of year that they might increase their prices seasonally. So definitely take a look at that as well. And, you know, the other thing I'd like to say about KOAs is we mentioned earlier about the journeys, which are right off of the interstate. And you would think that those might be less expensive because they don't have as much of the frills and the activities and things like that. But Actually, I think some of our more expensive KOAs have been journeys. And it, I think it's the convenience factor. You know, it's a lot of them are pull through sites and they're right off of the interstate and they just make life simple. And so we have paid $65 a night um, for some, especially coming up the East Coast. And the other thing about staying at KOAs is you can join their rewards program and there's some benefits with that um, free nights you build up points they also have uh, those weekends that are free for uh, members yeah like once a year they have like a member weekend or something where you get a deal um, every now and then they'll run these specials where you stay two nights and get a third free um, and in discounts like you said so yeah there definitely um, there are some advantages to that. It's not a free program though. It's thirty dollars, I think, a year or thirty three a year. But if you're going to stay at them, then it could be worth it. And then our most expensive. This is like a big jump now. I was at sixty five dollars a night, right? And now I'm going to go to a huge jump to talk about our most expensive campground that we have ever stayed at, and that we've already made reservations to stay at again next year. And that is Disney's Fort Wilderness. And it's expensive. Uh, we stay, so there's different levels of sites, and they also charge differently depending on the season. Now, our reservation, we stayed in November uh, last year, and we're going again in November, hopefully next year. Um, not Thanksgiving week. So we're talking like early, I think early. like the first two weeks of November. So this is not high season. And we stay, so there's different tiers of sites there's tent sites then there's full hookups but those are pretty short they're good for like pop-ups and maybe some short hybrids maybe vans um we have a 30 foot fifth wheel we like the preferred 129 dollars a night that time of year that's not counting tax and then um we also have friends who like to stay in the premium sites and those um are ab above 129 and depending on the time of year the premiums, especially during their high season, can be up to $200 a night, I've heard. So, Sean, why would we pay that? Uh, because you want to go. <laughs> He's blaming it on me. He's blaming it on me. Like um, this last time, he didn't go, hey, Julie, hurry up and check and see if it's available because friends of ours are going to be there <laughs> and they love Disney. Um, as well. I do love Disney. I'm not going to say I'm not excited about staying there, but also 
Fort, staying at Fort Wilderness is like you're staying on property is what they call it. Mm -hmm. So you get extra magic hour in the morning at different parks, extra magic hour in the evening. You get free transportation, free parking. You get to make fast pass reservations farther in advance. I think it's 30 days for regular people, but it's like 90 days maybe for if you're staying on property. Same with Disney dining reservations. You get to make those way far in advance. I think it might be six months. So if you like Disney, there are a lot of great reasons to stay on the property. Um, also, it just kind of has the Disney magic, but it's in an Old West theme is the, yeah. the theme of Fort Wilderness. But like Chip and Dale, the um, chipmunks, they're, they have a sing-along in the evenings, and there's nighttime movies under the stars, they call it. You can rent boats and bikes and all kinds of stuff like that. So I will say, if you're watching the video now, there are some restrictions with the um, coronavirus pandemic. So not all of the activities are happening. Um, they, Disney is already planning on ramping that up in 2021. They hope to get back to business as usual. But I would say if you're planning on it, just go. There's a lot of Facebook groups. Um, Disney Fort Wilderness Campers is one that I like. Find these Facebook groups and join them and people share about what's currently going on. And you can kind of get a sense for if you really think it's worth going now, even though, um, it might not have all of the same activities. Like we did have reservations for this, this month mm -hmm. and we canceled them. So, but we're hopefully planning on going again next year. So, you know, I would just say do a little research if you're uh, planning on that, but Disney, they don't offer any discounts except for, like I said, maybe a different type of site or a different time and type of year. But there are so many different ways to save. And we've shared a couple examples with you how we've saved. But a lot of these other ones, like Tucson Lazy Days, I quoted you the nightly price for when we stayed. That's not what we paid. We find a lot of other different types of discounts. We have lots of tips and tricks. And we get way into the weeds on those in our program, which is called Full-Time RV Finance. You can find it at fulltimervfinance.com and you have two options. One is the budgeting module and in the budgeting module is where we get very detailed on costs for everything related to extended RV travel, not just campgrounds, everything. And we also get into savings techniques for all of those. Um, well, we also just talk about the balance because that's how we're able to stay at Disney once a year yeah. is saving money other places and then stocking that money away for Disney. Yep. And then also um, that module, by the way, is $15 and it is uh, very extensive and you get free worksheets and handouts. And if you want, um, there's also a $49 program that gets way more into detail on all things financial related to RVing from buying an RV to still working and traveling and making money while you're RVing and paying off debt. Yeah. Okay, well, we hope this video was helpful. And like Julie said, if you want some more detail, you can go to our course at fulltimervfinance.com and check it out. And until we see you on the road, safe travels.